Hello, and welcome to a special Pride edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times read-along. Our guest is Mark S. King, an award-winning blogger, author, speaker, and HIV AIDS activist who has been involved in HIV causes since testing positive in 1985. Our guest, of course, is Sri, oh, sorry, our host, of course, is Sri Sridhavasan, the, the managing director for ASU's Cronkite School of Journalism's Cronkite Pro, starting July 1st, and co-founder of Digimentors, a digital and virtual events consultancy. My name is Neil Parekh. I am the executive producer and occasional guest host. We are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, our Digimentors website. We're also live on Mark's Twitter account, his Facebook page, and his My Fabulous Disease page. So for everyone joining and watching from the beginning, thank you, uh, particularly if you're watching on demand after uh, the live show has ended. What we want to do is before we start welcoming uh, folks who are watching, we want to give you a preview of what's to come in today's show. The New York Times Read Along is kicking off Pride Month with Mark S. King, an award-winning blogger, author, speaker, and HIV AIDS activist who has been involved in HIV causes since testing positive in 1985. In 2020, Mark was named the LGBTQ Journalist of the Year by the National Lesbian and Gay Journalist Association. They also awarded Mark their Excellence in Blogging honor. His blog, My Fabulous Disease, won the 2020 GLAAD Award for Outstanding Blog after five consecutive nominations. Mark was also named one of 2020's Out 100 by Out Magazine. Mark has appeared as a spokesperson on ABC News, 48 Hours, the BBC, CNN, and in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. His award-winning writing has been featured in The Advocate, Newsweek, Paws Magazine, Queerty, and TheBody.com. Once a week, he convenes a regular Zoom call with family and close friends to review the Ethicist column by Kwame Anthony Appia and the New York Times Quiz. Sri Srinivasan is our host. I am the executive producer and occasional guest host, Neil Parekh. Paula Kiger helps produce the show, engaging with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. Sri has been hosting the New York Times Read Along for six and a half years with some amazing guests. The show is produced by Digimentors. We produce high quality virtual and hybrid events for organizations big and small around the world. We also do social and digital consulting, training, and workshops. Again, Mark S. King is our guest, live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website. That's a little bit of a preview of what to expect in today's show. We're certainly excited that Mark uh, will be joining us today. Uh, we will be covering a whole range of issues. Uh, but it, in addition to talking about uh, Mark's story, uh, we will also cover, of course, the New York Times. Um, so without further ado, let's bring on our host, Sri Srinivasan. Hi, Neil. Hi, Sri. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for all that amazing work you do uh, to put the show together with Paula Kiger. It's so great to have uh, such great production values for the show and for everybody who's watching. If you would love to have a podcast or a conference or workshop or anything put together by our team at Digimentors, please let us know. We do digital consulting and workshops and of course, uh, these kinds of shows. So please do let us know. And a big shout out to our sponsors at Muckrack. Thank you for supporting us. Neil, we have so much to talk about and so much to discuss. And we are very excited to be with Mark today. 
Uh, we will meet him in just a couple of minutes. First, I just wanted to show you all New York City skyline. And uh, what's uh, the, you can see it's a beautiful day in New York. It's about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, 17 degrees Celsius. And this is looking at New York City from the Upper West Side. And you can see downtown Manhattan, you can see the Hudson River, and you can see New Jersey right there. And we are going to be reading the paper. Uh, and what I will do is just glance at the front page and then look at the fronts of the various sections and bring Mark on. Here you can see that uh, we have a story about four laws that might have saved lives in 35 mass shootings. We're always told that there are enough laws. The laws are not the problem. There are, and here you can see an important story about that. I do want to say that in Philadelphia last night, there was another mass shooting on South Street, a popular legendary uh, gathering spot where uh, 14 people were shot, three were killed. So the horror continues in the U.S. And here are trumpet strings and solace dozens of mariachis traveled together from San Antonio to Uvalde, Texas last week on a musical mission. In rural town, parents and students clash over mental health. And Ukraine farmer feeds a village as bombs fall. Is casino plan a bet to regret for New York? So lots to talk about. We'll, we'll examine the front section of the New York Times. The magazine cover is the New York issue. And I love this. I moved to New York for love, revenge, money, refuge, reinvention, art, and then fill in the blank. So any of you who have ever lived in New York would love to hear in the comments why you moved to New York if you did, or why you moved away at any point. And the Metropolitan cover, which only appears in print, uh, is an autistic teenager spiraling meltdown. Sabrina's parents love her, but with her unpredictable violence and chaotic outbursts, can she still live at home? And in the heart of Manhattan, a quickening pulse. Tourists, office workers, and New Yorkers from other areas are out and about in Midtown. So there is Rockefeller Center, speaking of New York City. The design special section, a breath of fresh air. It's about time to throw open a window and celebrate the comforts and inspirations of nature. And you can see here lots to talk about in the design world. And the book review cover is summer reading and it's extra thick, lots to look at and talk about. What books are you reading, folks? Tell us where you're watching from. Uh, please tag a friend, please share with a friend who would love to uh, hear from Mark and also uh, talk about the news. Uh, Arts and Leisure cover, make art on top of the world. The conditions are challenging, but Shuviani Ashuna and her community of fellow Inuit artists aren't letting geographic isolation get in the way of capturing global attention. Uh, that should be fascinating. And here is the real estate cover is revived with refugees re displaced from their homelands. People with similar yet different backstories have helped stem the decline in Utica, New York. That's in upstate New York, as you can see. So this will be a story we'll definitely be discussing. And Sunday business, the American NIMBY gets blamed for the nation's deepening housing crisis. And uh, she's saying not in her backyard. Greedflation. Or do the old economic rules still apply? We, I, knew, I know about stagflation, but here is greedflation, debating a long-standing theory when things have gone haywire, and they certainly have in many ways. Sunday styles. Brides are flocking to Scottsdale. The Arizona city has unexpectedly become the hot new place for bachelorette parties. And avid podcasters lift their masks. Anonymously, the ion-packed duo have teased an indie film world they seem eager to join, and the Sunday Review. I like politicians to look at the shattered face of what was previously a child and contemplate the terror of her last moments. In GOP, we trust. It's a tombstone. And here are the people responsible for so much of the problems in America. Tucker Carlson, Ron DeSantis, Chris Rufo, champion a new kind of secular conservatism that's supercharging the culture wars and winning. So we will explore as much of this as we can after we talk to Mark. So let's bring Mark on and say hello to, to Mark. 
Our guest is award-winning blogger, author, speaker, and HIV AIDS activist who has been involved in HIV causes since testing positive in 1985. He was named the 2020 LGBTQ Journalist of the Year by the National Association of uh, Lesbian and Gay Journalists, uh, NLGJA. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mark S. King. Hi. Good morning, Sri. Good morning. So great to have you with us. Uh, I'll start by asking the question I always ask, where are you, how are you, and how have you been handling the pandemic? Uh, well, thank you for asking. I am in Atlanta, uh, and uh, we, uh, my husband Michael and I have just moved uh, to Atlanta from Baltimore. Uh, he is a federal employee, but it turns out he can work from anywhere now, so I was anxious to get back to my adopted home of Atlanta. So we're settling in. I, I have uh, removed all the boxes from site because we're still we're still moving in. Uh, and in terms of how I'm doing or how I've been doing, um, I like to say I am uh, hunkered down with my favorite person. Uh, so that helps. Uh, and, uh, you know, I say as long as I've got Netflix, uh, I'm OK. Uh, that being said, uh, going into our third year here, um, there's a lot of kind of post-traumatic trauma that those of us living with HIV and who uh, experienced in the, the 80s uh, uh, have experienced in the reverberations of that throughout COVID. And by that, I mean uh, a new viral threat coming along that, especially in the first year of COVID, you don't, you don't know how bad it's going to get. You don't know uh, um, how threatened you actually are. And all of those feelings are very familiar to anyone like me who is HIV positive and survived the 80s. Um, it's, uh, it was a very familiar feeling. It brought back a lot of stuff for me in that first year. And, um, and now each, uh, each new viral threat, be it you know, COVID you know, flaring up again or monkeypox or whatever it might be, um, brings back a lot of that a lot of that kind of um, buried trauma, as it were, of uh, what happened in the 80s. Well, we want to talk about all of that, but this I, you know, for a lot of people who don't pay attention or haven't been paying attention uh, about, to HIV over the over recent years, the fact that someone who was diagnosed in 1985 and is still with us and thriving the way you are and helping lead conversations and inspiring people is, mm -hmm. is so special. One of the names from the 80s that uh, is front page news almost every day is Anthony Fauci. And there's a connection between his work earlier on AIDS and what's happening with the pandemic. And we can talk about that. And there's so many different directions we can, we can go. But I'd just love to uh, have you tell us your own story a little bit and want to tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, on on uh, your, your website is marksking.com. And your Twitter handle is at my fab disease. So let's start there as a jumping off point to tell your story. Well, you know, it's kind of a tale of two worlds in terms of my life with HIV. On the one hand, my website is called My Fabulous Disease. Um, that's meant to be cheeky. Uh, and it's, uh, it, 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 it uh, is a reflection of my privilege as a white man with resources and able to access the latest medications and good health care and doctors who uh, care about me. And um, that is obviously not the case for everyone. Like everything else in this country, it's, it's a tale of um, uh, access and the haves and the have nots. So I use my fabulous disease uh, site as kind of the home base for my writing work. You know, I have a little bit of imposter syndrome three because I hear the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and I'm like, oh my gosh, am I breaking every rule in the book because I've kind of made a, a cottage industry out of writing my own story, injecting myself into the story as a quote journalist. I see myself more as an essayist. I write first person about what happened and uh, what life is like now for those of us living with HIV. Uh, so yes, the, um, uh, although I am privileged and I am uh, lucky enough to have gotten out of uh, the 1980s alive, um, uh, the fact that I am a white male uh, has everything to do with that. Um, the fact that African-Americans in this country 
are uh, much multiple times more likely um, to be diagnosed and to die with HIV. Uh, a trans black woman has a 50% chance of, di of being diagnosed with HIV in her lifetime. Uh, so I am, I am very aware of uh, my privilege and why it is that I've lived as long as I have. That being said, I will not allow HIV to take away my joy. And, uh, and I live a life joyfully today and try to you know, be of service to other people. As we think back to the 1980s, so much has changed uh, in America, some of it for the better and some of it for the worse. But if you can talk about these 37 years and what are some of the things you have seen, uh, you already talked about you know, the disparities in healthcare, but also let's talk about, uh, as you talk about joy, you know, marriage equality and uh, things that we would be, have been surprised to no, maybe a younger version of you would have been surprised to see not only that you're here, but your life circumstances. Absolutely. Um, I'm first of all, I'm as surprised as anybody that I'm here. <clears throat> there were a lot of people who were just as empowered as I am, who made all the right choices, uh, who did not survive. Life can be so random. HIV and its effect on your body can be so random. Uh, and so I am very fortunate and there's a little luck to do with that. Um, in 1985, I tested the, the month that the test became publicly available. They had just uh, identified HIV as the virus the previous year. And uh, you weren't supposed to take the test. Uh, it was politically incorrect. There was nothing that good that could come out of it. You could be fired from your job and kicked out by your roommate and, you know, uh, generally treated as a diseased pariah. And there were no medications, not a single one. So why get tested? But the way I looked at it is if there was an envelope in front of you right now that would tell you whether you were going to be alive in two years, would you open it? I decided I wanted to open it. I wanted to know uh, how to plan. Uh, and, and I opened it. I got tested right away as soon as the test was available and I was positive. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other story. I, can, I will simply tell you that uh, living in West Hollywood, California, one of the epicenters of the epidemic at the time, uh, was a graveyard. Uh, it's been compared to a battlefield, to uh, being in the foxholes, and all of that is true uh, in terms of uh, waiting uh, to see uh, who was next and how bad it might be for you. And um, through pure luck and good fortune, I survived long enough until drugs started to become available to me, which I took right away. And um, and, and managed to survive until successful treatment in uh, the late 90s uh, became available. And, uh, and then I realized I'm going to live. Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I, I had never planned for that. Um, it wasn't on. Uh, it was never in my mind that I would plan for retirement, <laughs> for old age, uh, to, to have a future of any kind. I think that's what drives the joy that you hear is, is the fact that I'm, uh, I, I'm grateful for this new lease on life. Um, it was a little bit of an emotional whiplash to realize I was going to live after planning to die for so long. Um, and yes, to see the, the gains, you know, there's themes that come up in our culture all of the time, especially American culture. And that is our fear of sex. Uh, you know, certainly for me to even say to you, I'm HIV positive for a lot of people that immediately their mind goes to sex. Oh, Oh, he had sex and I know what kind of sex he had. You know, I mean, people go there and it's distasteful to them. Uh, those of us living with HIV are viewed as untrustworthy for some reason, as if there's something, some mistake that we made along the way somehow. Uh, it doesn't allow for the fact that we're human, all of us. And all of us, um, uh, our judgment isn't always perfect or we're um, alone or we're or, or we're, or we're um, lonely, or we're, we're, we're desiring other people, or, or uh, we're looking for a connection. And sometimes we don't make great choices along the way. Um, and that's, that's being human. So the difference between HIV and COVID, of course, is an ocean away to see how the government responded to COVID early on. Um, I was so gratified to see that. And yet I I wished that it had responded as quickly um, 
uh, around HIV and AIDS as it did around COVID. And then finally, you mentioned marriage equality. And, and just from a political standpoint, all I can say is um, they're coming for that too. Right. And uh, we have <laughs> to be very, very cautious going forward. Right. Uh, for those who haven't, uh, you know, have, aren't aware that one of the underpinnings of the ruling that's about to come out from the Supreme Court is the right to privacy is yeah. part of the abortion debate or the abortion ruling that's going to come. And using that, they can go after marriage equality as well if they want to. We know they want to. So the, we should not rest. We should know that things are, you know, in, in lots of things are in danger in the in the months and years ahead. I uh, just want to ask you about Ronald Reagan and the government response. You mentioned it a little bit. Uh, how much do you think things could, would have been different if they uh, had acted differently? If he oh, had... oh, completely, absolutely, completely. Um, and remember, this was a time when LGBTQ people were just getting some political power. We were just finding our power and our strength. Harvey Milk, that era, and and uh, and then to have this thing happen, this horrible disfiguring disease that was rooted in our sexuality. Um, you know, there's a debate to be made about whether that ultimately helped our cause as LGBTQ people or hurt it. Did people see us as as getting what we deserved, or did they see the humanity in us as we facing mortality and against all odds and with society so much against us, the, the preachers on TV, the politicians uh, who wanted us to be sent off to a, an island somewhere. I mean, there were intelligent people debating on the floor of the Senate whether we should be sent to an island and, and quarantined mm -hmm. to an island somewhere. I said, if they give us Maui, we'll go. <laughs> you were able to find humor in, in, in oh, the- Oh, we must. Yeah. We always, we always yeah. must find I find the humor in these things. But yes, had had Reagan responded differently, we would be looking at a different crisis. If they had responded in research and development in the way that they had with COVID, for instance, which I don't resent, I'm glad they did it. I just wish they'd done the same for AIDS. So that name I mentioned earlier that was involved in both, uh, both oh. the pandemic and in AIDS, and that's Anthony Fauci, who was uh, then one of the leading researchers. Uh, Friends like your friends, including Larry Kramer, the leading yeah. activist, we have a photo of you and him in a bit that we can show, were very critical of Anthony Fauci. And uh, there is, uh, there is Larry. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can mention Larry and then talk a little bit about Fauci. Uh, well, first of all, the one thing I want to say about Larry, particularly since it's Pride Month, is Larry had great love and affection for gay men. He believed in us. He believed that we were capable of amazing things. And his anger that you saw, his public facing anger, um, I, I'm not saying that it was manipulative or it was inauthentic, it wasn't. He was very angry and disappointed in us, I guess, as in gay men that we weren't doing more, that we weren't fighting as hard as he was fighting because he loved us so much. He said something to me once that I found so provocative at the time. He said, I believe that we as gay men are better than other people. And it really took me aback because it was, uh, first of all, it runs counter to everything I was raised to believe. I am lesser than other people. And he said, oh no, we're greater because in the face of discrimination and hatred, we build and we fight and we love and we minister to other people in the face of this great tragedy known as AIDS. We are better than other people. And, um, just the very provocative nature of, of believing that I am worthy of that sort of value uh, made a great an impression on me. And and uh, one of the things that some people are saying now about gun control or abortion is that you need that anger to, you need Democrats and others to be as angry as the Republicans are, you know, steadfast in labeling and calling out folks on the other side. Yes, uh, I, I, I refer to them as the murderous Republican Party. I can't think of any other uh, adjective uh, to describe it other than murderous, that this would be allowed over and over and again and again. And then the inanity of, of the suggestions that, well, we just need to get retired military people on the scene um, to, to protect these kids, you know, is, is inane um, to watch the college coach 
devote his press conference to screaming about our lack of action on gun control. Um, and, and yet here we are. I, I feel like, should I be devoting this entire interview to screaming about gun control? Maybe I should. You know, um, uh, it's, it's foremost in our minds. It's happening every single day. And uh, yes, and yet the GOP is extremely good at messaging and on uh, leveraging distrust and fear about things being taken away. Oh, my rights will be taken away if we give more rights to someone else. Oh, my guns will be taken away if we give more um, uh, safety measures to someone else. Um, so their messaging is very good. And, and uh, what happens in the next couple of elections uh, scares me. Yeah, and that you can apply to climate change, abortion, gun Certainly. rights, so many, so yeah. many things. Uh, thought on An Anthony Fauci? Uh, Anthony, it's funny because he has a, an interesting character arc over the last 30, 40 years. He was almost our nemesis. I was not a treatment activist, but my friends who were saw him kind of as uh, our opponent because he was very conservative minded in terms of how he approached treatment research. And yet we had these brilliant treatment activists at the time uh, who, who were saying, oh no, we can't wait. We can't wait for a clinical trial that takes three years, four years. We want accelerated access to these experimental drugs and we want them now. We cannot wait. And they proposed and the FDA accepted completely new treatment protocols uh, on, on how to research new medications. Those protocols now apply to all drugs. One of the great gifts of AIDS activism, and then there are many, is the fact that um, we have accelerated access to all sorts of drugs and all sorts of disease categories because AIDS activism convinced the powers that be that we can't wait for years and years to watch this, this treatment uh, research process slog on. Uh, so Anthony Fauci was convinced of that and over the years has become um, um, much more of an ally. And uh, uh, it's funny, he, he shares a, a particular friendship with uh, iconic activist Peter Staley from How to Survive a Plague. They have a very interesting kind of close relationship uh, that I admire and it kind of shows you because Peter was at one time, you know, uh, uh, hanging off the rafters of the FDA in, pro uh, 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 in protest of, um, of uh, people like Fauci. And so, yeah, Fauci's had an interesting character arc over the years. One of, uh, one of the people I've interviewed is Sean Strub, uh, who has written extensively about Anthony Fauci and his delay in uh, what, as you were describing, in some of the treatment options and research options. And also he had said uh, what was known, at, what was thought was true at the time, that just being in close family contact could give you HIV, which of course turned out not to be true. And uh, th so there is, as you said, that character arc and story arc of Anthony Fauci is fascinating. Folks, we are talking to Mark S. King. We are talking about uh, what's happening in the news. We're talking about his life and career. We're gonna be discussing the New York Times, which I have here. Uh, so please tag your friends, tell them uh, to join us. They can watch live or later. As soon as this show is over, we'll be on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We're live every Sunday discussing the news with fascinating people. Jonathan Borstein is watching from the East Village. Jonathan, thank you for uh, all your support of the show and everything that you do. Doug Levy is watching from unusually rainy San Francisco at 5 30 plus a.m. Uh, I was being one. funny by calling it the unusually rainy uh, <laughs> San Francisco. And uh, Miles Rose is watching from sunny San Juan. Welcome. And Paula is watching from Tallahassee and producing our show. Uh, she is one of the folks who helps make the show so good because she is uh, annotating the show as we go along and posting comments and, uh, and helping people understand. And Gunther Baylor is watching from Austria. Good afternoon and welcome. Amy Parik is watching from the West Coast in Seattle. That's Neil's sister. Uh, thank you, Amy, for watching. Miriam Berkeley is watching from Hell's Kitchen in New York City. And uh, just great to have everybody here. And this is a family affair. Neil's mom, Sada Parik, is watching from 
Long Island this morning. Good morning, Auntie, and, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. Aaron K. Hall is watching from Baltimore. And uh, do you want to uh, give a shout out there, Mark? Oh, absolutely, to Aaron in Baltimore. I've got some peeps in Baltimore. Yes, that I, of course. I'm glad to see. Yeah, and uh, just great to have everybody here. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, before we get to the paper, let's talk a little bit more about your career. And Neil has put together some photographs to help tell your story. So, uh, oh my, uh, well, yes, let's by all means start at the very beginning. <laughs> Uh, that is me at 19 years old um, on the front row of The Price is Right, about to get on stage and win a car. Uh, I, uh, I, have, uh, um, I never met a camera I didn't like. And for some reason, I was uh, just uh, all American enough to be selected to be on The Price is Right. My boyfriend, who was wearing a matching outfit, was in the audience with me. And Bob Barker at one point actually asks me, uh, while I'm on stage uh, playing the game. Now, do you have a girlfriend back there at home? And I said, several, uh, which is kind of true. Um, meanwhile, they're showing my, my boyfriend at the time in the audience. Uh, over the years, people have asked me, why didn't you come out? I'm like, oh my, you must be very young. You know, back <laughs> in 1980, you did not come out on, on uh, television game shows. And that was just a different time, I guess, that people- Certainly, yeah. absolutely. Who, who, um, is, who is this beautiful person? Yeah. I beg your pardon? Who is this beautiful person? <laughs> that is uh, 1985. That's the year I tested HIV positive. Um, that's the face of a young man uh, who thought he had a very different life ahead of him and uh, was, uh, you know, in a relationship and starting a career in Los Angeles. And uh, again, I thought I had a very different life ahead of me and, and had to grow up very quickly had to uh, learn about uh, 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 sickness and dying and uh, what it's all about. I, I, I like to say that, that um, you know, we have big life questions in our lives that we think we have our whole life to figure out. Who are we? Why are we here? Is there a God? Um, what does it all mean? And we think we have our whole life to figure that out. We think we have this much time. And then you test HIV positive in 1985 and you have that much time. And I had to face a lot of questions and I had to I had to reach deep in terms of what our humanity means. And I think what I discovered is our humanity is one another. Our, our humanity is the love we show one another. And certainly that was true for the uh, many friends who I said goodbye to and made sure that they were comfortable and knew that they were loved in their final moments. And unlike I will just say, unlike the deaths now and you know the million people who have died in the US now, as you hinted at, there was, there were people angry about the folks who were dying and vilifying them, uh, and and saying terrible things about them and that they yeah. deserved it and all of that. I uh, I was only 12, 13 when uh, you know they were using the word gay cancer before they even knew the term HIV in New York, and remember and I remember that uh, that that arc of of the uh, of the crisis as well. Yeah. And and tell us about this photo. That's uh, 1993 in Atlanta. Uh, so let's see, I was 32. Um, even in 1993, to wear a T-shirt, even at a gay pride event that said, nobody knows I'm HIV positive, was um, considered daring. Um, it's funny, we as uh, LGBTQ people are not immune to the kind of stigma, social stigma that we thrust on one another. Um, you know, kind of um, identifying the other is, is a popular human activity. It's an easy way to, for us to feel better about ourselves when we identify the other and shame them and, and make ourselves feel superior, right? Everyone does it, uh, there are too many people do it. And uh, even within the gay community, this is Pride Month. And like Larry, I would like to see um, my fellow gay men um, step it up. And, and have more uh, compassion and love for one another, and including those of us living with HIV. Thank you. Back in the day, early on, I was an actor. Like I say, I never met a camera I didn't like. <laughs> uh, that's a McDonald's commercial I did. Uh, I was a commercial actor. I thought that was my future. Sheree, I thought I was going to be the uh, uh, the funny next door neighbor on some sitcom. You know, the the, the sexually non threatening funny friend. Um, and I uh, did not make it there. Instead, I'm sitting here with you and I'll take it. 
But tell us about the commercial. What do you remember the lines or the? the oh, do I remember the line? Yes, <laughs> it's McDonald's fabulous rodeo to riches. Uh, the director kept saying, "Mark, could you put a little less emphasis on the word fabulous?" <laughs> <laughs> too gay, too gay, even for him. Uh, that is a protest in Atlanta in the '90s. Uh, even into the 90s, there were needs uh, to, uh, and a lot of activist activity. It didn't, it didn't all just uh, fade away uh, in, in the uh, uh, early to mid 90s. There was a lot going on. And there was a lot going on outside the big cities, in small cities. Shreveport, Louisiana had an ACT UP chapter. You know, um, there was a lot of activism throughout the country. We should be very proud. If for those who haven't looked very carefully, I see handcuffs. Oh, yes. I was, thank you, I was handcuffed to the, the, the health department. And I will say that the DeKalb County police in Atlanta were very nice. They were very friendly. They came up and they said, what are you doing? What do you want us to do? I said, I want you to arrest me, you know? And they said, well, shall we do it now? And I said, well, we're waiting for channel four. And they said, okay. And so they went back to their car and hung out, waited. And, and channel four arrived and they came, they played their role very well. You're under arrest. And they dragged me off. And then they let me out around the corner. So um, it was a rare chance and uh, opportunity in which uh, the police played their roles and were very respectful and kind. And you, what was the that particular protest? What were you pushing? Uh, that was a protest over some uh, very antiquated health department policies um, about the um, uh, about quarantining uh, somebody uh, with a, a viral uh, infection and how unfair it was to his uh, to his human rights. Sri, I want to make one point, if I may, about something that a lot of people don't know about. And it's it's my kind of, you know, it's something that should be discussed. And that is you equals you. Hmm. And that is a hashtag that you'll see amongst AIDS activists. And it means, there it is, it means undetectable equals untransmittable. I am undetectable because I am on successful treatment. And as a result of being undetectable, meaning that the HIV virus is so uh, low in my bloodstream that it cannot be detected by the, by the tests that they have, which are very sensitive, by the way. And uh, most everybody who is on successful treatment reaches an undetectable level. Well, we now know through years of research that people who are undetectable are unable to transmit HIV to their sexual partners. And when this was proven several years ago, it was like a, a, something had been lifted off of me. None of us living with HIV would ever want to harm someone else. And yet to have this scientific evidence that, that even with, with um, uh, uh, sex without a barrier, without condoms, even sex without condoms, we were, are unable to transmit HIV to our sexual partner. And uh, that's really important for people to know. It's hard for people to accept. There's a lot of fear. We're kind of the victim of our own success. We have made people so afraid of HIV infection over the last three years for good reason um, that it's, it's, it may be hard for people who have been around those messages for so long uh, to, um, to take in. But the fact is, is those of us who are undetectable are untransmittable to our partners. That's and, uh, important. And we've got reason hashtag, to get on treatment. Pardon? We've got the hashtag on the screen. Hashtag you equals you spelled out uh, yeah. because that's how hashtags work. And yeah. uh, that, that's such an important insight. And I'm sure it uh, it, it helped you and and your mind and rested your mind. my mindset completely. You know, it's easy, you know, to be out there as an HIV activist and to tell people about empowerment and still have a bit of shame or worry inside. And to have that removed because of this new science is, is amazing. Here's a comment from Mary. Good morning from Onacock, New York. Uh, Virginia, I'm sorry, Onacock, New York. Virginia, uh, Mary, Mark is, a, is such a gift to not only the HIV, AIDS, and LGBTQIA communities, but to all humanity. His work benefits us all. Thank you, Mark. What a wonderful tribute to you, Mark. That, that, that's, that's, that's very nice. I, I appreciate that very much. And I, I, I hear where she's coming from. My husband will be certain to cut me down to size after this interview. But <laughs> I, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. And Brad says, iconic, great interview. Thank you, Brad. Thank you.
and Lapina, Fab the Fabulous Marquez King. You know, um, I will say that there are, um, I know Lapina, and there are a lot of uh, Black women on the front lines of this. As a matter of fact, I, I think that the most activism, the most exciting activism these days are coming from women, women living with HIV. Uh, uh, you know, I, I always say activism is generally led by those with the most to lose. And um, because Black women, African Americans, are at such great risk, uh, they are still fighting so hard. And those of us like me, you know, Sari, it's kind of like gay men fought really hard in the 80s and early 90s. And it's like we got what we came for. We got the research. We got the drugs. And a lot of us got what we wanted and we left the playing field. And we left behind people who are more vulnerable, who need that activism uh, more than ever. And, and, and I, it's so important that those of us who got what we came for stay and keep fighting for the rest to make sure. And, and, and those fight are being led, by the way, by not us, but um, by uh, women like Lapina Reed. So important. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. And folks, uh, as you're watching, we're talking to Mark S. King. He's at My Fab Disease, and he's going to tell us about this fab photograph. <laughs> Well, that is a photo, and believe it or not, that's actually the moment that I proposed to my husband, Michael. I had a friend hiding behind a tree, and we had scouted out that location, and he even told me, okay, you need to be kneeling right here so the water's just right. And that's in uh, that's the foot of the Poconos in Milford, Pennsylvania, and, uh, and it's Christmas Eve. Uh, we celebrate our seven-year anniversary on Monday, tomorrow. Oops, tomorrow I need to get a card. And... Uh, we uh um i it's one of the gifts of survival uh that um that are sort of so many gifts ahead. there is life and love and meaning and joy beyond an hiv diagnosis and it's beautiful beautiful photograph uh and can you talk a little bit about marriage equality and what it means and why the journey to that was so important including domestic partnerships, civil unit, all of that, What uh, and what changed with getting it? And as you said, there's already danger to it. The, well, there's certainly danger to it. I, I must admit that it, the, the, the swiftness of marriage equality, uh, you know, when, when the dam broke and various states started doing their own individual domestic partnership, t marriage type uh, laws enacted, and then the dam broke, the dominoes all fell, and suddenly the Supreme Court came out. That Supreme Court, of course, is years ago. Uh, we do not have that Supreme Court today. Um, elections matter. And, uh, and uh, who is naming those Supreme Court justices matter. And um, I, I will tell you, much like U equals U kind of gave me a lift, I remember the day that the Supreme Court came out with that judgment. And Michael and I walking down the street of, of, of Washington, D.C., holding hands. And I just had a spring in my step. I felt like it shouldn't matter that the government acknowledges me. I, like, in other words, my love should be enough, right? Uh, but to have your culture, to have your government say uh, you are equal. Not more, though. Not more than. You're just equal. You deserve the same. Um, it, it, it's it's it addresses everything that we need to in, in, uh, imbue in LGBTQ people, and that is self-esteem, a feeling that we are, uh, we are enough and that we are equal and that we are valued and loved by not just our families and our friends, but society, our government. Uh, to take that away uh, would be taking that gift away from the young LGBT person who is now coming of age and wondering if they belong in this society. We have triple the number of uh, youth suicides uh, as, as other groups. And there's a reason for that. They don't believe like they belong in this world, in this culture. And we have to do everything we can to prevent that from them feeling that way. Thank you. Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar says, my husband and I were at Stonewall by the park the moment that Governor Cuomo signed marriage equality into law in New York City. The joy all around us was wonderful. And I remember that moment. And we had a photograph that we we're going to show 
and uh, tell us uh, about this photo. <laughs> oh, that's my husband saying hello. I'm so glad that he did that. Um, I'm I'm very proud of him. I always say that he's a fancy pants and much more uh, smarter than I am. Um, I don't know what I can tell you about his work because he's always saying I'm a, a federal employee, so be careful. Um, but it's not like he works for you know home homeland secure. He runs uh, he runs healthcare.gov. He's the program manager for healthcare.gov. And whenever I get hot my on my high horse about my traffic on my little blog, my fabulous disease, he says, "Oh, Mark, that's that's very nice. That's good, good <laughs> for you. I'm so glad you 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 got that milestone." You know. Meanwhile, of course, healthcare.gov is is uh, providing healthcare to millions and millions of Americans. And I got to say, he's wearing a better shirt today than you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, it's, tell us what's going on here. We're doing every Sunday morning uh, since before the pandemic. It's three years now. Uh, th that is various friends and my brother there on the lower right. We get together on Zoom and we read the ethicist and decide what the ethical response to Kwame's, uh, the, to the query to Kwame might be. And uh, we generally agree with him. And uh, it's really just an opportunity for us to get together and tell old stories because every question always reminds us of something that we, we have to share. Uh, we also do the New York Times news quiz. We start with the news quiz and then go to the ethicist. And thank you for sharing this because I want to show you that our score average is 10.67 out of 11. Wow. Take that. 10.67. Uh, we probably were having a very good week that particular week. Uh, and you, you, you folks are clearly even bigger fans of the New York Times than we are. Uh, we're, we're big fans, and now we're fans of your show. Oh, uh, thank you very much. What I am going to do is uh, let, let's uh, talk about your mom here in this beautiful photo. You know, I just, uh, you know, who doesn't love a mom who loves you? And mine certainly did. I, I get so much. I get my brains from her, that's for sure. And she raised six kids. We like to say two of each. Two boys, two girls, two gays. And uh, she raised six kids, then went back to college, uh, went to Oxford and became head of the LSU library system. So she's an amazing woman. Um, but she was also all about education. And as soon as I tested positive and HIV, uh, HIV positive in 85, she went to work, going to the library, reading newspapers, finding out everything she could about HIV and treatments and what was coming down the pike and uh, was uh, uh, my biggest cheerleader. And... Uh, uh, an, an example of what happens when um, um, a mom uh, cares. That's a blog post, what it feels like for a mom, in which I interview her and ask her really candid questions about what happened with her when I tested HIV positive and uh, what was going through her mind. And, uh, and she's very honest in her answers. She told me things that she'd never told me before. Um, she passed away a few years ago at the age of 94, and we miss her terribly. Oh, and I'm sure Mother's Day is especially difficult for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it it um, it makes me smile. I've gotten to the point uh, where uh, her memory doesn't hurt. It, it brings me joy. That, that's great. Uh, tell us about this as well. This is an annual day. It was um, trumpeted by Tez Anderson, a long-term survivor, uh, living in San Francisco, who thought that we should devote a day. June 5th is chosen because it was the day of the first... Um, uh, report in the uh, in a uh, CDC journal about a mysterious new illness among gay men that was killing uh, gay men. And so th this is Long-Term Survivors Awareness Day. This is for education. It's to honor those of us who are still with us and to honor uh, the, uh, the conflict, the war, the trauma that we went through. Uh, and also to acknowledge, I think, all people living with HIV and the fact that um, we are still here and we're lead, leading lives of purpose, but there's so much yet to be done. There's so much inequity that is yet to be resolved. Thank you. And uh, we're so happy that you're, there, there is more attention being paid to all of this uh, now. So I, I was going to go to the front page of the New York Times, but since you are big readers of both the New York Times ethicist column as well as the uh, uh, the 
uh, etiquette column. Uh, oh, the so social cues, social yeah, cues. Social cues. Yeah. So we thought we would uh, put you on the spot and I will read this question to you. And then okay. Philip's answers are also, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, but let me ask you this and then you tell us. Okay. Condoms cause a rift. Our 19-year-old son is staying with us during his college summer break. While my wife was vacuuming, she discovered a box of condoms under his bed. It was unopened, but I'm still furious. My son knows that I strongly oppose premarital sex. He's also well aware of my general philosophy, my house, my rules. When I confronted him about the condoms, which I discarded, he denied they were his. He claimed he was holding them for a friend as if I were an idiot. I would like to throw him out of the house, but my wife disagrees. How should I proceed? Oh, I'm I'm so mad, but you go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right. First of all, um, good for him, the son, for protecting himself and having the good sense, which he probably got from you, Dad, uh, to protect himself, prevent pregnancy, and prevent other uh, sexually transmitted diseases. So good for him. I understand that you have this no... My house, my, my house, my, my house, my rules thing. Okay. Uh, it didn't, he doesn't suggest that he was having sex in your house. Um, and uh, he needs to be uh, more careful about how, where he leaves his condoms. But for goodness sake, um, this is the kind of judgment that prevents um, honest conversations about sexuality, about, you know, uh, about, and to have this, to have this definitive, um, point of view, you know, no sex before. Well, you know what? That's what gets us so many millions of teenage pregnancies every year. That's what gives us, um, you know, uh, 50,000 new HIV infections every year is the fact that there's such an uh, absolute and uh, sexual behavior is not absolute. So thank good you for that young man for using condoms. Yes, uh, I agree. And just I'll read a little bit about Philip's uh, Philip's answers here. It says, at 19, your son is a young adult. When you threaten to throw him out, you create a conditional home where he's welcome only if he accepts being treated like a child. I respect your wife's objection here. And I, I also think you're er heard in discarding the condoms. If he is sexually active, they are an important safeguard against unwanted pregnancy and and other and sexually transmitted diseases, regardless of your belief. So I think you've got it exactly right, as as did Philip. So well done. Good for them. Yeah. And, uh, and this now is, he's going to have to go out and buy another box of condoms. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure uh, they're not cheap. Uh, so this was this is the cover of Sunday Styles: is brides are flocking to Scottsdale for bachelorette parties. Uh, but let's look uh, at the front page of the Times. Uh, folks, we're talking to Mark S. King. He's at MyFabDisease on Twitter, and his website is MarkSKing.com. I'm just going to glance through the paper, and please jump in on anything that you'd like to respond to and you have thoughts on. Uh, we said last night in Philadelphia, 14 people shot, three people killed in a very fun-loving atmosphere on South Street in Philadelphia. Here are four laws that might have saved lives in 35 mass shootings. And by the way, you've heard this. There have been 21 mass shootings since Uvalde. And here's this very dramatic picture of mariachis uh, who have traveled from San Antonio to Uvalde to, on a musical mission uh, to help soothe that town. You know, I know that the what I call the murderous GOP is just waiting until uh, the, uh, the outrage goes silent long enough for them to to uh, ignore this again. Um, but I think maybe the rates of mass shootings, tragically, um, are going to work against them because they keep coming fast and furious, don't they? To the degree that maybe the outrage will not uh, lessen long enough for them to ignore it. And this is the online version of the story. And here are the each shooting and what might have changed if the laws had been different. Um, I love time. the way the Times has done this. I read this story this morning. I get my I get my Sunday Times, <laughs> and uh, I um, I love how they did this because look how 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 simply they show you each one of those mass killings. The highlighted area is the law that might have that that could have prevented that particular shooting from happening. And if you add up all of those, I think they do a total on it. There's hundreds of people. Almost uh, 500 people, yeah, would have been saved. Would have been saved. Yeah. 
That's tragic. In rural town, parents and students clash over mental health t tension over proposal for clinic in school. And this is that, you know, someone who's reading the New York Times could write that letter to the ethicist, uh, sorry, to the etiquette column about condoms and have these old fashioned ideas shows you that how far we have to come in this country in so many things. And here it is that they are protesting having mental health clinic in a school and that people are upset about that. That's just so shocking to hear when yeah. we know we need uh, help. You know, parents claim that they're taking um, th their job um, away from them by providing services like sex education or mental health services. Um, but those are being offered precisely because parents don't right. want to address those things. Yeah. Uh, while I have you, can you talk a little bit about Florida and what's going on there and this don't say gay bill and uh, everything that's around that? Well, I, I, I do love the cheeky and creative ways that people are saying gay, gay, gay mm -hmm. uh, every chance they get in Florida. Um, I'm wondering when where is the tipping point and is there one? when uh, these culture wars, such as the gay and, and, and the governor versus Disney and all of that, when is the tipping point where people see it for what it is, which is this you know, cheap red meat to the, to the base ploy uh, with these culture wars, you know, as opposed to, for instance, all of the dead children, you know, uh, wh wh where is the tipping point where uh, I remember a time when these culture war ploys got old. You know, and and we stopped uh, we stopped stopped taking the bait on on gay people and and all of that. Um, it seems to be coming back. You know, everything old is new again. Yep. Um, yep. It, it makes me sad. Yeah, very very sad. Uh, Ukraine farmer feeds a village as bombs fall, and you know that story. It's so been a hundred days of war now, and uh, one of the stories I read is that Putin is just waiting for the West to move on and get bored or. Uh, blink first. Exactly. Not much, much like the gun, you know, the gun control battle. And I think Macron made a real uh, stumble when he suggested that, you know, we don't want to embarrass Russia. So maybe we should give a little, I don't know, give up a little land or something like that. I think maybe he should shut the hell up and let Ukraine manage Ukraine. They seem to be doing a bang up job so far. No, they, they certainly are surprised so many of us. Yes. Um, I had actually missed this news, but did you know that three casinos have been approved for Midtown Manhattan in the New York City area? And so this is about how much will this affect uh, the city and what will happen? This is a, a big deal. And uh, th they say that uh, it's very rare to have casinos in the center of large cities. And now we're going to have that in New York. And what... What will that bring with it is going to be fascinating. It sure will. Shadow group for Putin gets rich in Sudan. And this is a gold miner in Sudan where the Kremlin-backed Wagner group is expanding its operations. Uh, stunning photo here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's move on here. It'll be interesting also to see, by the way, if there are any pride ads in the paper for Pride Month. And I'm interested in your take on how. Well, uh, by all means, let those corporations, you know, put up a gay flag, pride flag for, you know, 29 days uh, and then move on without supporting us in terms of the states that are uh, trying to uh, ban gay marriage or whatever the next controversy will be. Uh, I get a little cynical about uh, the corporate takeover and all of the booze companies that want to support pride uh, for one month a year. Uh, th you're, you're absolutely right that that's there's so much discussion around that and are they are, is that money that they could be spending on actually supporting the you know the actual work that activists and other whereas they are meanwhile uh, supporting you know uh, conservative candidates uh, yeah. who want you know to annihilate us so yeah. Yeah. Uh, here are four films to stream before they leave Netflix in June. So tell us if you, your thoughts on them: Silver Linings Playbook, Desperado, The Exorcist, and Her. Okay, well, you know, I'm a huge horror fan, uh, thrilled about the new Cronenberg movie, Crimes of the Future, which I can't wait to see. So Exorcist, actually an excellent, excellent movie about faith and uh, fear and faith. Uh, and so uh, it has so much more to say uh, than pea soup. 
the international section get New Ze uh, rid New Zealand of predators. Traps are not enough. So this is about predatory animals. And uh, let's keep going here. Jubilee honors the queen, but also highlights her increasing absences. And there's been some conversation, including an excellent column by Sean Tarur in the Washington Post saying, you know, the Jubilee also highlights how little the crown has done to acknowledge the evil it did in the world. You know, the apology, where are the apologies uh, for uh, imperialism and uh, all colonialism? Yeah, and I don't think you're going to get that from King Charles either. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe King William. Yep. Bronze. So before, before you move on, if you don't mind, I just want to pull up, uh, apropos to your discussion a few moments ago, Mark, uh, GLAD's recommendations for corporate allies. They put out a blog post recently um, in terms of uh, what corporate allies, what it means to be an ally during Pride and some uh, you know, suggestions that they what had. What's one of the suggestions, Neil? Yeah, it's, uh, let's see. So especially during... Uh, uh, Don't market to the moment, join the movement. Nice. Exactly. Don't market to the moment, yeah. join the movement. This is what you're saying too, Mark, and that's so important. Yeah. Showcase the diversity of the LGBTQ community in advertising. A lot of the ads actually have no faces. Have you noticed that? They're just like flags on their existing it, logos. There are no actual... Yes, logos. yes. It's just throwing a rainbow um, yeah. you know, up there and calling it good. So uh, I know Paula will share a link to this post uh, in Facebook and Twitter, but just thought it'd be good to point this out. Of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in Taipei, mourning Tiananmen's victims and uh, the Hong Kong that was, uh, this is, I believe, the 33rd anniversary and just really mm. sad to see all that's uh, happening in Hong Kong. Yeah. Migrants to UK build life outside of Hong Kong, so a related story. And then look at this gun safety ad. It's not gun control, it's gun safety. A Vet Voice Foundation, right? One of the things we're told is that everybody in the military supports uh, and veterans support uh, not having gun control, but there you see uh, veterans asking for yeah. gun control. And then we have Lindsey Graham saying, well, those veterans need to show up and you know start policing the schools. Yeah. Yeah, that's what veterans need to do. <laughs> exactly, who are, many of them are traumatized and have high rates of suicide and other issues, right? Yeah. Um, um, Jonathan Borstein asks, asks uh, what does Mark think about the Reclaim Pride groups? So it's, can you explain? I love the Reclaim Pride groups, and there's a Reclaim Pride march that's an alternative to the more kind of commercial uh, New York City uh, march. Thank you very much for mentioning that. You know, Pride was a riot, right? Gay Pride was a riot. It started uh, because LGBTQ people, especially um, the T um, were uh, rioting in Stonewall over unfair treatment by the police and constant arrests and harassment by the police. Uh, and yet you have um, uh, the police well integrated into this very commercial, corporate uh, pride culture that happens in city after city. Um, I appreciate the fact that everybody likes a half naked man gyrating on the top of a pride float. Um, who doesn't? But uh, it seemed to uh, run, run counter to what this is about. And this is about an original pride, an original riot that was uh, driven largely by outcasts, by the misfits, by black trans women, uh, you know, uh, by people who uh, maybe uh, are not corporate ready if you were to look at them today. Uh, well, that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for the acceptance of all people not just the people who look pretty on Sunday morning shows, uh, but people who are in fact misfits and we want them to be able to fit into the larger culture. So reclaim pride, yes. Thank you. And here's one of those extensive New York Times stories about what's happening in the Sudan and how it's connected to, uh, to things happening in Russia. Uh, trumpets, guitars, violins, and a little solace amid Uvalde's tears. Uh, this is about that mariachi group. Another opportunity to bring beauty to something that's so tragic. Uh, art, um, art, uh, you know, comforting us. Republicans draft diverse candidates in a bid to control the House. And uh, here's a Republican who is Latino with a focus on inflation and border security and an appeal for unity. Some lawmakers embraced nativist anti-immigrant language. Of course they did. Uh, yes, they did. 
Yeah. And uh, here, two graffiti artists, New York Subway. Uh, for two graffiti artists, New York Subway was a deadly magnet. And uh, you'll remember in the 80s what New York City looked like and what New York City subway car is. I show these to my kids who can't believe uh, because now it's all very corporatized, uh, very sanitized cars. So uh, they find that. I can't help but wonder what Giuliani of the 90s, uh, who cleaned up Times Square, would think of these uh, casinos. <laughs> yeah. You can't ask him, of course, because he's not the same man. Oh, no, but, he's, uh, he's lost it in every way. Yeah. Look at this indoor mask requirement returns in California County. And then big story, the baby formula shortage. And the plant that uh, has restarted, the Abbott plant, uh, they had contamination concerns, so I'm sure a lot of parents who are happy to have this back may also be worried about the contain, uh, contamination element. And here's that article that we were talking about. So everything you see in yellow would have prevented deaths in these mass shootings. So that tells you something. Uh, Air Force sergeant sentenced to 41 years in killing a federal officer. Uh, a shooting meant to heighten unrest over George Floyd's death. Wow. Uh, here is a uh, big, big Senate race, and John Fetterman, who is running for the Senate as a Democrat, almost died from a recent stroke. Uh, I, I like reading the obituaries. I know people who lived through the AIDS pandemic would uh, have a different relationship with obituaries and, you know, paid or otherwise. Can you talk about your well, that may be true and certainly yes you know the obituaries page was our way of keeping track of who was still with us and who wasn't and i mean but literally because there were hundreds and hundreds and people our age right um but i also got to say you know I, I i'm not defined by that trauma you know i mean i i am able to look today at the new york times obituary which are always jauntily written um about uh subjects and to learn about people who i might never have known like this guy george shapiro mm -hmm. who got seinfeld and and trumpeted uh talent like andy kaufman you know uh i really enjoyed reading that obituary thank you that's that that you're you're you find joy and happiness in 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 various places which is oh, really absolutely yeah. and then this is the original gerber baby uh this is the woman who uh was the gerber baby dies at 95 so that's also an unusual wow. story her wow. life has graced gerber jars for over 90 years wow and she's gotten to see that uh you're a big tennis fan so let's uh talk about uh, your fandom well you know i was sorry for coco Gauff and losing in the final uh to swiatek but the fact is is that who can beat swiatek right now you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know who. Now, I am an enormous freak about Serena Williams. It's why I started watching tennis 20 something years ago, because she was disrupting, you know, she was disrupting the status quo. Right. And so I'm like, yes, go. And uh, and so watching her career, I don't know if Swiatek would stand a chance against a, um, you know, at, at her height, Serena Williams, uh, who will always be the greatest of all time, men or women. Um, but that, that all being said, um, I'm, I'm very happy that Coco got in the, in the finals and good for Swiatek, who is uh, breaking records herself nearly every month. An important column by Kurt Streeter about women's sports and how tennis really tops women's sports in, uh, in pay, for example, equal pay has now come to women's soccer in the U.S., mm -hmm. but, uh, or, or pay quality has come, but in, in women's tennis, so uh, Swiatek walked away with $2.4 million, the same as the men since 2007, which is really good. But why do golf, soccer, and basketball lag even further? And that's in the U.S. In other countries, it's even worse in most other countries. So important column. Mm -hmm. And the iron steel cable connecting the Mets and the Dodgers, and this is about Gil Hodges and his connection to these two iconic U.S. baseball teams. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. We actually haven't run into a Pride ad, at least that I noticed in, in the no. paper. Maybe we will. Uh, folks, we have about uh, 20 minutes with Mark King. We are talking about so many different topics. Please uh, send us your questions or comments, and uh, we will uh, ask Mark as we go along here. And uh, uh, and please follow him on Twitter at myfabdisease. Uh, look at this in GOP we trust Tucker Carlson, Ron DeSantis, Christopher Rufo champion a new muscular conservatism, uh, a muscular and secular conservatism. 
Uh, Russia is down, but not out. I mean, that's the other part I want to say, Mark, that we talked about how Ukraine has survived so far. I think a lot of us were thinking that the international financial blockade would knock Russia out, and it hasn't yet. It has not yet. Uh, it, you know, it'll be interesting to see. It's all it's all scary. It's not just sad. It's scary uh, about what uh, Putin is capable of. Um, because there's nothing worse than an injured animal, nothing more dangerous. Yeah. Psychiatrists may decide abortion access. Lying about a woman's mental health could be path to receiving care. Show us the victims of Uvalde. There's been some controversy about this, right? Should you see images of what a bullet does to a young kid to shock people? I think Larry Kramer would have agreed with that in the case of uh, the fight for uh, you know AIDS help. This is that same spirit. What do you think? There are famous photos of uh, people dying of AIDS covered in lesions so much so they were nearly unrecognizable as human. Uh, with the uh, approval of their loved ones, I think absolutely. And here is Cheryl Sandberg's long overdue goodbye. This is the great Kara Swisher saying the Meta CEO leaves a leg mixed legacy of financial success and corporate denial. She was more than anyone responsible for a lot of the ways in which Facebook thrived on the misinformation and disinformation. The doctrine of the irreligious right, thou shalt not woke. And uh, it's a Nate Hockman column. When the world healed. PEPFAR shows us how successful response to COVID-19 could look. And this is about, uh, yeah, here's a photo of vaccines being distributed in the Ivory Coast. And Elon Musk masks dysfunction with hype. His long list of unfulfilled commitments wildly exceeds his achievements. And of course, uh, there are so many Elon Musk fans, uh, fanboys who will uh, attack everybody who says anything. Uh, why are boomers still governing? This cohort has managed to hold on to power for an exceptionally long time. And uh, here's an editorial. Who killed the journalist Shireen Abu Akleh? And, uh, and then this was the Johnny and Amber starry, sorry spectacle and why we watched it, Maureen Dowd's column. Uh, did you follow that? No. And uh, expanding democracy is the solution. The only minority that fears majority rule, elites. I mean, that's one of the things, isn't it, Mark, that uh, the Republicans have convinced everybody that they're the party of the common man when almost every one of them is an elite himself. Well, absolutely. And they have a great uh, talent for using power when they have it, and even sometimes when they don't. Uh, uh, Democrats are much more reticent to use the power we have when we are in power. And so we keep getting, we keep losing ground and losing ground. I, I believe the next two elections are about democracy itself and about who will have power. And uh, I don't think majority rules necessarily uh, is going to be ruling our nation before long. Yeah, as you see that now, uh, Trump, who did not win the popular vote, got to name three of the nine justices. It's so uh, so upsetting. Um, 11 parents on how to teach history, race, and gender. Uh, important piece, uh, talking to parents. And what about LGBTQ history in America? Uh, this is not really taught, right? If you talk about so many things not taught in America, there's not enough being taught about that. God, if you can't discuss race and racial history and the, and, and the history of black Americans, how the hell are you going to talk about LGBTQ people? Yeah, no, that's 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 absolutely absolutely right. Uh, here's an article about greedflation, or do the old economic r rules apply? You remember stagflation, of course, uh, from the '70s. You know, and you mentioned this article earlier, and I'm I'm admit to being ignorant about it. I have no idea what that is. I, I'm going to have to read that article. Yeah, I, I have not heard the word greedflation, so I will look forward to reading that. Not in her backyard. Uh, this is about. Uh, Susan Kirsch in her backyard, just a few hundred feet from a site of a proposed multi-unit housing development that she's been fighting for 18 years. Uh, even uh, people who would otherwise want to ease the housing crisis can be amongst the most, uh, you know, uh, reticent to help other people. She's a Sierra Club member with a pesticide-free garden. She has an Amnesty International sticker on her front window and a photograph of a refrigerator of herself and hundreds of other people spelling out tax the 1% on a beach. 
that's the kind of person you think might be open to this. So if she's not open, then what hope do we have? You know, you talk about development and overdevelopment. I live in Midtown Atlanta. And when I moved here the first time in uh, 1993 to lead an AIDS agency, we lived in, we, we worked in a small little craftsman house surrounded by fields. And uh, that was directly below where I am now, which I would like to show you what it looks like, the fields. And yes, the please. Oh, wow. <laughs> no fields. Oh, my God. No. That, that just directly below me is where the AIDS agency was that I worked in 1993. It's, it's now the pool for one of these uh, high rises. That, by the way, is Google headquarters just to the left there. Oh, okay. so uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite different. Um, I think there's one craftsman house left down there, which is an Italian restaurant that wouldn't leave. Uh, and uh, God bless them. Wow. Uh, we're looking here at the arts and leisure section, making art on top of the world. And this is how uh, some uh, native peoples in Canada are able to get global attention, even at the top of the world. Here's Death of a Salesman, and, uh, uh, and Wendell Pierce is acting in it. Uh, he's a great actor, so mm -hmm. this is a diverse casting. That's a very interesting, interesting production. Yeah. Uh, tell me about some of the uh, the, the play, recent plays or musicals you've seen, uh, arts and leisure. Like, so let's talk about any of the topics here that you're interested in. Oh, you know, well, I, I haven't made it to New York to see any of these original plays, and so I, I'm uh, so I focus on what I'm available to me to stream, and I'm very excited about the new <laughs> comedy called um, uh, Fire Island because it includes a queer cast. And we're finally getting films about queer people in which we're not just the joke or the funny gay friend that wanders in and makes you know a funny statement and leaves. We're central to the story and we're being played by other queer people. And uh, I think that's a very important shift in how Hollywood does it. Um, uh, there's a, a new movie coming out. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget his name um, uh, uh, about uh, bros. It's called Bros. Uh, and uh, written and directed by a man whose name I'm about to forget. Um, but it is another queer cast presenting queer lives, uh, a romantic comedy. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm reading here about a Michael Jackson musical and a Karate Kid musical. Uh, it's, it's One almost... problematic to me, the other not so much. Yeah, yes. Uh, the Island of Misfit Toys is now uh, a collective of young musicians and dancers preparing for the Ojai Festival and true to Chekhov even with the r robot. Uh, so so much to read and uh, understand here into a bright new darkness. Uh, this is about uh, finding ways to scream, squeal and wail for the voiceless and uh, the myth of liberal Hollywood. What mainstream movies tell us about the business now and this also mentions uh, Top Gun and the new Top Gun sequel and talks about celebrities who've done well in Hollywood, including conservatives who have done well in Hollywood, James Woods, Mel Gibson, Clint Eastwood, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ronald Reagan. Wow. Like these are people who, uh, uh, John Ford, Cecil De B. DeMille, Jimmy Stewart, John Wayne, Charlton Heston, mm -hmm. right? Where, when, whenever, the next time someone tells you that Hollywood's all liberal, talk about these folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is A.O. Scott, the co, uh, chief movie critic writing here. And this is David Simon reflecting on The Wire. And you when Michael were, and I moved Baltimore, to Baltimore, um, yeah. so we moved to Baltimore eight years ago. Yeah. And uh, the first thing we did was watch The Wire. Now I know we should not be, <laughs> it's not history, historical about Baltimore, but we couldn't help it. We wanted to see what popular culture had to say about our new, our new home. And it was a little unnerving. Yeah, for, uh, for sure. And look at this, the American presidency with Bill Clinton, the toughest presidential decisions that shaped America. So I guess he's now a, a TV host. And wow. talking the wire after two decades. Uh, and, and there's so much more to see here. Uh, we just have a few minutes left. I do want to talk about the book review and the magazine as well. So uh, what are you reading these days? 
You know, I've been, I've been on a big um, biography, I think autobiographies and biographies, usually um, sports figures, uh, celebrities. I'm reading, uh, you know, nothing brand new, but I'm reading uh, uh, Vincent Price's biography, a daughter's uh, biography by his daughter. Absolutely fascinating. I thought I was going to read about his horror movies. Instead, I'm reading about his international travel and his love of art, which I did not know. I did not I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, here are the, uh, we haven't looked at the bestseller list. I haven't looked at it in, in, in a couple of months here and just seeing what are some of the books, nonfiction, The Office, BFFs. This is uh, Pam and Angela from The Office uh, have a book out together. The actresses have a book out together. And Phil, a book about Phil Mickelson. And then, oh God, Bill O'Reilly has another book in the bestseller list, River of the wow. God. Uh, which is about 19th century expeditions in Africa and Finding Me by Viola Davis, which should be a good book as well. And uh, and as you said, there there's so many books, it's hard to keep up, obviously, as yeah. there are movies and, and everything. And then the design cover, uh, the special section, A Breath of Fresh Air. It's about time to throw open a window and celebrate the comforts and inspirations of nature. So since we've been looking at your design sensibility behind you, I thought we would get a quick tour of what's behind you. I see at least three pieces of art that you should talk about, including that light. Oh, well, that light is, uh, is uh, you know, $60 on Amazon, but it changes colors and, and uh, does a great pride display. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on uh, that counter, that, that's a Baltimore artist. Albert Schweitzer is his actual name, uh, who does uh, uh, three-dimensional sculptures. And I, 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 I love that piece. And then directly behind me there is, uh, that's a play on the Robert Indiana, you know, love mm -hmm. um, uh, motif. It's by a, an AIDS uh, artist collective called General Idea out of Canada. And they actually, that's a piece of the wallpaper that they wallpapered a, uh, a, an entire um, uh, a museum with uh, and to promote the fact that AIDS uh, can be love, it can be, uh, and, and to, uh, I think, just, juxtapose things that we see as um, light and love-filled with something that was so tragic. Um, I, I'm, I really enjoy that piece. And Paula has linked to uh, Albert Schweitzer, the artist. Oh, well, be, be thrilled to see that. That's great. And what we were seeing there is that uh, it's a three-dimensional piece of artwork, right? You can see that it's uh, it's relief work, right? So you can yes, see yes, it is. And and uh, Michael's also posting. Uh, that's 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 pretty cool. Uh, so we just have a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to look at uh, the New York Times uh, magazine cover here, and it's uh, the New York issue. And tell us about your relationship to New York City. My relationship to New York City, I, I, I get there when I can. It's, it's not a lot. I'm afraid I have to love it from afar. I'm there just seldom enough to completely forget how to get around in between <laughs> visits. Um, you know, but uh, there are several shows that are on my list to do. Uh, I love the New York Times Magazine section. Unfortunately, there is no ethicist this week. Yeah, otherwise we would have gotten to uh, hear your take on the ethics column. And uh, this is all about New York. There'll be so much to read in here. And uh, I can't wait to uh, uh, go through this and, and see all the different stories here. But this was, this was the interesting uh, headline that uh, I moved to New York for love, revenge, money, refuge, reinvention, and art. Well, uh, I've, I've moved to one city or another for each one of those reasons. <laughs> I want to hear in the revenge lifetime. story maybe offline. Uh, yeah. we, you can tell us about it. <laughs> Uh, and this is there was some criticism online of this uh, of this story about roommates and as if the New York Times discovered roommates happen in a housing crisis. But we've always had roommates, right? Uh, people, young people living in cities always had roommates. Immigrants always had roommates. So this is not that new. But uh, this has been uh, there's been a lot of coverage of this story online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, this is. This is about uh, thrown together by a brutal housing market. New York's roommates find a way to get by even in close quarters. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is uh, this is what they're saying. Look at this. It's just perfect, perfect. And then it just flows yeah. out because I guess it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing is, right? Uh, 
So uh, what we're going to do now, Mark, is we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'm going to bring Neil back on, give you a chance to kind of catch your breath. And then I'm going to come back to you. Uh, we're going to do a little housekeeping, but come back to you to share some of your uh, final thoughts with us, things we should keep right. in mind for Pride Month. And Good. also also to hear your thoughts on your journalistic work. Uh, we'd love to get a tip from you uh, about either writing about uh, LGBTQ issues or covering LGBTQ issues. So we'll come back to you in just a couple of minutes. Right. <laughs> I mean, thank you. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you so much. What a great uh, conversation with Mark S. King, uh, HIV AIDS activist and blogger. Um, particularly uh, for me, it was, it was actually poignant to see those pictures uh, from when he was first diagnosed in 1985 and being on, you know, The Price is Right at 19 and having a budding TV career. Um, but it, it, I think that the big thing is that at the time, it, it was a death sentence. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have to, if people don't remember or people who are watching now, like at the time, that was it. You yeah. had HIV and, and, and your life was over. And I know Mark wrote about how he expected to die within a, a few years and and obviously that didn't happen and he's a longtime survivor of, of hiv today is uh hiv longtime survivors awareness day so uh, we're so thankful that mark was able to join us we do also want to ask him about his book one thing we didn't get to sri is his memoir uh, a place like this um which you know covers his early life in los angeles i mean this this quote from his webpage. Once you've won a car on a game show, been an actor, owned a phone sex company, been infected with HIV, slept with a movie icon, and developed a drug addiction, you've pretty much done the Hollywood thing. Um, we, we're going to need to go another hour, I think, Shri, to cover <laughs> some of those things. But uh, it really was was great. Uh, before we bring uh, Mark back on, I do want to make sure we can acknowledge, in addition to Sri and myself, who everyone people see on camera, Paula Kiger is such an incredible part of this team. And not only uh, does she uh, drop in links in Sheree's Facebook and LinkedIn, she was also watching Mark's Facebook uh, and uh, the My Fabulous Disease page. She's also a longtime friend of Mark's. She's written, uh, done some projects with him. So thank you, Paula, for bringing Mark uh, to us today. Uh, and of course, Paula and I both work with Digimentors, uh, the consulting firm that uh, Sri that you started, uh, we're so thrilled to be working with you on this. Uh, if you're interested in having us produce a show like this for you, please get in touch. Our emails are at the bottom, Sri at digimentors.group uh, or Neil at digimentors.group. We do, in addition to producing events, we also do social and digital consulting, help with training and workshops, uh, podcasts, etc. So please. Uh, uh, definitely get in touch. We'd love to to work with you. Uh, we also want to uh, give a shout out to the local connection newsletter. The Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University brings you the local connection newsletter. Each week it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. And best of all, it's free. You can subscribe at bit.ly slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. Uh, and um, a programming note, we have two incredible guests coming in at the end of June. Tom Jolly, the print editor of the New York Times, will be joining us for a third appearance. Um, on, Father's last, on Father's Day. The last two years have been on Father's Day. Last two times, rather. Uh, the first time we were at his house, on his at his kitchen table, looking at the New York Times with the print editor. That What, a, what an incredible moment. And then I'm particularly excited at the end of June, Amber Williams, the editor of New York Times for Kids, the special print only end of the month special section. Um, she's going to be joining us to talk about New York Times for Kids. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Um, anything else, Sri, before we bring Mark uh, back on? No, I'm, I'm excited about those shows. I want to thank everybody for watching. Please tag a friend right now. They can watch us as soon as we're off the air in a few minutes. It'll play on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And we do this every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. So thank you very much. And let's bring Mark back. Mark, thank Hi. you so much. Thank you both. I have a message for anyone who is LGBTQ here in Pride Month. 
And that is if you are young, I have a secret for you that you might not know yet. And that is that you could be powerful beyond belief. You could be loved. You could be valued. You have to value yourself. And um, to do that, you might have to look beyond the people that are closest to you because they may not value you yet. But Pride Month is about believing in yourself first. And then you're going to find the people that will invest in you and believe in you and love you the way you deserve to be loved. And then as far as HIV Survivors Month, the best weapon we have against HIV is for people to know their status and to get tested. If you have a sexual history or a drug use history of any kind, that is nothing to be ashamed of, but you want to value your own health by getting an HIV test and finding your status, finding out your status, because that is the best possible news either way, because you can receive treatment and like me become undetectable and unable to transmit the virus to somebody else. So get your HIV test. And if you're LGBTQ, especially if you're young, believe in yourself, you are loved. You just may not know it yet. And uh, uh, thank you so much. So powerful, these words. Uh, anything you'd say to journalists who are allies and want to cover LGBTQ issues? You know, treat us with respect and remember that LGBTQ people exist 12 months a year and that um, policies around who we are, uh, we are. Uh, uh, so, yes, yes, we exist year round. Um, uh, our, our, our rights and therefore our lives are under threat in a way now more than ever and we need to turn our attention to that because uh, uh women's rights are human rights lgbt rights are human rights thank you so much what an important way to end our conversation with mark s king jonathan says great show both informative and entertaining thank you jonathan and uh yeah, michael says i i love the new york times cooking uh, and, and I do want to mention, uh, <laughs> Michael and Mark, if you stay, you know, stay, we'll we'll stay in touch. We're working with Sam Sifton to have him on the show uh, <laughs> later, hopefully later this summer. So uh, from the New York uh, Times, yeah, he's the genius behind uh, how they've taken that and really packaged it in such interesting and new ways. We so, will be watching. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Great. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mark. We'll give you your Sunday back and uh, please say hello to Michael and uh, we wish you the very best in everything you do. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.